start it and it's being recorded and my Facebook page. About to go live. Got it. Okay, looks like we've got some people joined. And it looks like we're live on Facebook too, so that's good news. Okay. Um, yeah, for your, those of you joining, we'll start in a couple minutes here and wait for the rest of everyone to join. Um, Everybody is muted except for Mac and myself. And so we'll have time for question and answer at the end. We'll go ahead and let Mac talk for 45 minutes and then do 10 or 15 minutes of questions. So you can put that in the comments on the Facebook Live if that's how you're joining or there's a, there's a chat or Q and A box here on the Zoom stream. So we'll do some question and answer at the end. Um, I know Mac's always good for answering some questions and looks forward mm -hmm. to that, so. Um, yeah, we'll give it a couple more minutes. I might have to reiterate what I just said there, but, um, yeah, I'll let people keep I'll, joining I'll, here. I'll take, I'll take questions for the next hour after the webinar is <laughs> yeah. over if people want to go. <laughs> Only person I won't like, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to have you on back for just a Q and A segment, maybe some week. <laughs> Let's see. Who gave you that nitro radish hat, Jaken? Um, I stole it from the office today. So don't nice. tell Doris. I think probably <laughs> she has claim to it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we've had several of these around. So yeah, it's important, it's important the products, I guess. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I need a Korean Les Padiza hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have one already. <laughs> it's just a matter of time now <laughs> that's funny um so it is 5 30 now um yeah like like i mentioned a minute ago we'll let matt go for 45 minutes talking about uh, his presentation there and what he's doing and then we'll have time for 10 15 minutes of question and answer at the end um again everybody's muted except mac and myself so um we'll just do the q a um afterwards on the, the chat box and Q&A. Um, so yeah, while Mac shares his screen, I'll just give a, a short kind of brief intro and then let him take it away from there. Um, second here. So yeah, Mac has been farming uh, from a very young age. And although he is still young, he has a wealth of experience because he's been doing it for a while. Um, he is 100% no-till across all of his acres and implementing cover crops on those acres, as well as applying soil health principles and livestock to his land. Uh, just this year, Mac received the Young Regenerative Producer of the Year Award from Soil Health U. Um, so Mac, hats off to you, my friend. It's always a, a pleasure and joy to talk to you. So I'm really excited for all of these folks tonight to hear what you have to say as well. So take it away. Well, thank you, Jacob, for that. And thanks to Keith Burns and the rest of Green Cover Seed staff for having me. I'm excited to present today and uh, maybe help spread the knowledge. Um, so first of all, we'll start off with my family there. That's my wife, Kayla, my son, Jax, Emma and Evie going down the row there. That's what I call my herd, the original herd. Um, and, you know, that's really one reason I farm, you know, is to leave something for my kids. You know, if they want to have a, a part of agriculture, I want them to have something you know, that's in a better place than whenever I got it. So uh, how I got started farming uh, in when I was when I was 20 years old, my dad passed away from cancer and I inherited my first piece of ground. So I kind of got a clear go at that. Um, and the first 59 acres that I ever had uh, was paid off and clear. Um, it's now 74 acres total. We've added a little bit to it that, that borders it. And, um, you know, it just, it kind of got me help started farming. So we're at 650 acres now. So we've grown a little bit uh, from where I started, you know, 
I'm 27 now, so this has been a seven year process. So we're not quite in 100 acres a year that we're adding, but um, next March, I'm taking over another 140 acres of row crop ground. And uh, I've got that under contract for another year, so that's good. And uh, we also run 80 cow calf pairs. We custom graze, uh, you know, anywhere from an, around 80 to 150 cow calf pairs. We have laying hens. Uh, like I said, I like to make the joke that my laying hens are a nonprofit organization. I probably don't make any money out of them, but you know, it's something new and my kids enjoy them. So, you know, it's something good to have. I also sell cover crop seed. Uh, right there on the star, that's where Jasper's located. It's about 30 miles north of Joplin. So I'm in Southwest Missouri, a fairly warm climate and a 42 inch rainfall environment. Um, you know, we can put in covers just about year round. I've put in covers in every month of the year um, so far. And I don't really see when there's not a time to put cover crops in. So here's the typical Southwest Missouri soils. Uh, soil on the right is actually a picture of my one of my farms. And that's the major reason why I don't till. So, you know, uh, Michael Thompson, he's a friend of mine. He told me years ago, he said, Mac, buy the land that you can afford, not the land that you want. So what I can afford is the pile of rocks that you see there on the right. <laughs> and uh, and then on the, on the picture on the left, that's just a farm about four or five miles away from this other farm. And, you know, it's under a very conventional system, heavy tillage, uh, deep tillage. And every year they just take the disc on through that area and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Um, that, that picture there, it's about three feet deep there. I mean, if you get a tractor tie off in there, you're probably hung and you can just see the massive amount of soil erosion. And, and our ground in our area, I'm kind of in a pocket that's fairly flat. Um, now there is some hills around us, you know, in the Ozarks and stuff, but I, I'm kind of in a pocket that's flatter. I've got some hills, but not much. So my farm, we focus on the principles. We don't focus on practices or products. So what I mean by that is I don't get caught up in interseeding or relay cropping and things like that. Now, I think those have a place. Like I believe that interseeding has a place up north. Um, I believe that, you know, if you're after phytonutrients and phytochemicals, you know, interseeding with the different plant species would be very important. Um, you know, products, I don't use any kind of biologicals on my farm. We're not using very much fertilizer anymore. Uh, we're down to one herbicide pass an acre on a farm, sometimes none on an entire year. So, you know, I hope we're all familiar with the six soil health principles. So I'm not gonna really take a whole lot of time to address those, but those are what the principles are. And that's what my farm is really about. You know, I try to focus on all of those principles and implement those principles on every acre, every single year. And I'm proud to say that in 2021, we are now 100% fenced on all the land that I own. And so we can get livestock on every acre now uh, of ground I, I own. Uh, now, some of the rented ground, I can't on 180, but all the rest I can. So that's really big. You know, that, that animal integration, as we talk about later, is huge. And you can see I'm changing my soil there. That's a picture of some cereal rye. And, you know, my soil is starting to get darker and I'll go into why that is. I, hopefully everyone kind of knows a little bit about that, but um, you know, yeah, just follow the principles. Don't focus on practices and products. You know, I think that's how we can be successful in this. Hey, Matt, I started no-tilling in 2012. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. yeah, I love that. And I think a lot of people are familiar with the, the principles. Do you want to kind of expand on what context that first one kind of means to you? Um, I don't think it's new, but I think it's interesting to hear different people's perspective on that. Yeah, so um, so context, you know, that's, to me, it's a spiritual context. Um, you know, I do things because I believe it's right, and I believe that's the way that God wants to, me to treat my farm. Um, also, another part of my context, like I said at the very beginning, was I want to leave something for my kids to have. And uh, so, you know, my ecological context, you know, my rainfall, that was the reason why I talked about where I'm from. If you're from a drier land or a drier place, you know, uh, you might have to think about different cover crop species you're using. The principles still work anywhere, but the main thing is understanding your personal context. So that's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. But perfect. Um, yeah, so in 2012, started with no-till, started no-tilling soybeans. That's my son, Jack's out there in a soybean field. He was about two or three when that picture was taken. Um, and you know, I tell everybody, you know, I feel completely safe with my son being out there. There's not any unwanted pesticides out there anymore. There's no neonics on the beans, corn, or wheat. Um, I don't use any fungicide passes over the top. Uh, I, I, I've limited my insecticides to none, typically. Um, I, I do manage that, though. If I do see a complete issue like an armyworm infestation, I've got to make, make the decision um, and spray sometimes. So 
I'm I'm not 100 uh, percent anti insecticide, I guess you could say. But if I can keep from it, you know, I try to I try to keep a home and habitat for the predators. But, you know, it always doesn't happen like that. Uh, first cover crop was in 2013. It was a prevent plant situation on double crop soybeans. Uh, I went to an organic conference the year before and I was pretty lucky that uh, to hear some presenters talk about how cover crops were doing for their organic farms. And, you know, it's kind of set the seed. I was at that time full bore tillage, uh, you know, doing multiple passes of nitrogen, fungicides, neonics on my seed, on my seed treatment, planting high population corn. You know, I was, I was down deep with like, you know, some of those high yielding guys. I mean, I was on top of that stuff, but it wasn't working. It wasn't paying the bills and I had to change. And so, yeah, in 2013, my very first cover crop was just oats, radish, turnips, and crimson clover. Really simple cover crop. I planted, I strip tilled corn into it the following year. Uh, the corn did all right. It wasn't anything to brag about. I think it was like 110 bushel of the acre, and I still had a lot of inputs in that. But, um, you know, that's just kind of my first stepping stones into cover crops. 2016 rolled around. Everybody told me, okay, you can no-till soybeans. You're no-tilling wheat, but you cannot no-till corn in our environment. We're just too wet in the springs. Um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a failure. It's not going to work. They said it essentially couldn't be done. Well, in 2016, I harvested 98 bushel corn and, uh, and everyone else around me harvested 120 bushel corn. So it, they, to an extent, I believe were right. I don't believe no-till corn alone will work very well. And so that's when I started doing some research. I was in a very bad financial place at the time, to say the least. Um, the wife wasn't very happy. The banker definitely was not happy. Um, and so we had to make some major changes on my farm. You know, I was kind of like this cow. Uh, I was stuck in a bad place. And, uh, you know, I needed to get on over that fence and, and uh, take some steps. So I got the good, I had the good fortune to hear these guys. So the first time I ever heard Gabe Brown talk uh, was on a YouTube video. And I thought, my goodness, this guy doesn't know anything about farming. I said, he doesn't know the first thing about farming. I shut him off. I, you know, I kept researching. I kept coming up with cover crops as the way, to, the key to no-till. Well, I come across a video from Ray Archuleta. Like I said, this was a couple months after I'd watched the video from Gabe. And Ray talked about how Gabe Brown, well, that name rang a bell, a bell with me in my head. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go back. So I, I went back to YouTube. I found Gabe Brown. That second time I heard him, everything just clicked for me. I mean, it was 100% like, okay, I get it. I get the principles. I understand them. If he can make this work in the northern desert, surely I can make this work down in southwest Missouri. So by fall uh, 2016, I was 100% uh, committed to following the principles, and I changed some major things on my farm. Full crop soybeans were gone. At the time, I was in a wheat, double crop bean, corn rotation. I cut out double crop beans. Every acre was then covered. I have not been fallow since 2016. Every single year, I get a cover crop in. I don't care if it's December. I'm putting a cover crop out there. I stretched my rotation. I got away from that two-year rotation. I'm now on three and four-year rotation. I adjusted my planting dates. I started planting my beans earlier in April and started planting my corn later in May to maximize nitrogen production from cover crops. I changed my maturities on my, on my hybrids. I created a farm budget. That was pretty important because I would say my spending was kind of getting out of hand before I created a budget. I've essentially turned my farm into Dave Ramsey's farm. Uh, if Dave Ramsey could run a farm, you know, I would hope that he would be proud of me besides, besides my debt. You know, I'm still co-owners with the bank on some land, but besides that, I hope he would be happy with me. Uh, I've diversified my cash crops. I'm no longer just raising wheat, corn, and beans. I raise a variety of different crops I'll go into later. Started building fence. This is a key component here. I became intentional. If you understand the principles, you need to be intentional with the principles because you can understand them. But if you are not intentional with like understanding carbon nitrogen ratios, understanding, you know, uh, not to put a bunch of legumes in front of soybeans because that might be a nitrogen crash. If you become intentional and start doing your research, you'll be successful. And then I went to daily moves on the cattle. Um, I, I believe that, you know, cattle are the quickest way to change your soil. Um, you know, I, I think that if you, on the landscape themselves, cattle and livestock in general can do more for your land than anything else. Uh, I put this slide up there because I like to kind of talk about how my grade school, my grade, my, my son in grade school and other kids in grade school can probably tell you more about how a soil ecosystem works over the average farmer. And what I mean by that is that's, I'm not, I'm not, you know, 
I'm not trying to be degrading there or anything, but what I'm trying to mean by that is, you know, we do things on our farm that has an effect on everything else. So like neonics, for example, okay? We have to understand that they have a negative impact on something on our farm, whether that's insects or, you know, or water or something. We have to understand that. So we focus on that first key component of like, let's say killing a root worm. But, you know, as we learned back in grade school, when we think about the food chain, what happens when we take a piece out of the food chain? Okay, that's not good. So if we keep taking pieces out of the food chain, we're eventually going to run ourselves out of the food chain. Um, you know, these neonics we've learned are very hard on honeybees. If we don't have honeybees, folks, we don't have food. And that's just plain and simple how it's going to be. So uh, shifting gears here a little bit. Um, I put this up there. I want to show, you know, this is from the University of Minnesota. Give credit to them. You know, they show the cost of tillage. You know, there, you know, I know there's some organic folks that are still doing some tillage and things like that. But I really believe that we need to get away from tillage, number one. First step in all this, you know, is getting away from tillage. And I've seen that very early on. I was paying like upwards of twenty dollars an acre to have someone come and till my ground. That was not profitable at all. Um, and I think nowadays, even if you own your own equipment, I'm going to say a minimum of twenty dollars an acre is what it costs you per pass. Because we think about the inflation of fuel prices, um, the cost that we put back to buy the next piece of equipment, whether that's the next disc or the next big tractor to pull that equipment, we are always setting that money back aside to buy the next piece. So that has to go into our, uh, our, our, our acre rate. And then as well as, you know, farmers tell me all the time, well, my time's not worth anything. So I can set a tractor and work ground all day. And my next question to them is, okay, if your time's worth nothing, can you come work for me for free then? And then they put up the red flag. Whoa, whoa, my time is not for free. Well, then you need to be charging that to that too. Um, so, you know, this right here says that, uh, you know, to the planter pass on a no-till is $20.15 per acre. Maybe that's figuring in more wear and tear on your seed disc. I'm not really sure. I'd actually disagree with that because um, what I've seen, uh, my tractor has a, a fuel consumption uh, indicator. And I've actually noticed that whenever I plant on my cover crop ground, it actually uses less fuel than when I plant on bare soil. So that's, that's pretty big, actually, if you think about it. You're saving a little bit of fuel costs with that. This is my fall tillage. Um, you know, everyone talks about radishes. You need radishes to break up compaction. That's not necessarily true. I actually disagree with that statement as well. You need those grasses at first. Those grasses will help alleviate those small micropores and expand those pores. Uh, grasses have much fi more fibrous roots, so they'll be able to find those little channels and expand those channels. Um, so really, if you're, if you're wanting to break up compaction, I really would recommend putting in grasses first over these brassicas. Um, there's also uh, many other reasons why I, I would recommend that, you know, and, and never go with just a solid brassica cover crop mix. It, it, that's one of the most hard things on your soil there is. Uh, so, you know, speaking of tillage, um, 2019, we had record, record rainfall. We had over 100 inches of rain on my farm. And, uh, you know, this was, I took that picture down the left after a five or six inch rain was coming in. And these two fields here are across the road from each other. The only thing that divides these two fields is a row. And my, my farm, of course, is the picture on the bottom right. That was a warm season cover crop mix that I had grazed out. And then I put a cool season mix after that. And the picture on the top right was a chiseled field. Now, if you're trying to diversify your cash crop with raising catfish down the channels, the chisel rows, I would highly recommend doing that top right uh, a system. But I believe from a soil health perspective that the, the, the system on the bottom right, my system, is a lot better. Um, you know, you can tell I'm infiltrating that water. We had that huge rain, and it's going down on my, my soil profile. Now, I will say in spring, I am wetter. It takes me a little bit longer to dry out. The tillage guys are always planting before I am. I'm sitting on my hands trying to be as patient as I can. Um, and I understand, you know, but think about that. If we go dry in the summertime, that same principle applies. What's going to dry out faster? That tilled soil is going to dry out faster. The worms. Uh, first time Ray Archuleta come to my farm, Ray put a shovel in the ground, of course, and, you know, he, he complimented me on the amount of worms I have. Now, I've got a lot of night crawlers, which is a good thing, but I've created a home and habitat for the worms. You know, when you raise these large cover crops and then you graze them down and they're laid flat along the soil surface, along uh, the distritosphere, you know, those worms are going to pull that plant material down. And so I'm giving them a bed and breakfast. Um, I'm not destroying their home with a piece of tillage equipment every single day. And, you know, 
people ask me, well, what do worms matter? Well, this is an analysis on worm casting. So worm castings are 26% carbon. Now that's pretty important. I want you guys to pay attention. The largest percent of the worm casting itself is carbon. Now I didn't lay out everything that was on that test. I just wanted to highlight the main components of it. But another one that sticks out to me is 3.7% calcium. I have never applied any lime on my farm since I've owned my farms. And I believe this is a part of the reason why. The, those worms are cycling, you know, that plant residue and particles of the soil back through their bodies and helping to bring calcium available to the my following cash crops and, and or my cover crops, whatever you're going after. And that right there is a picture of my farm. Um, that's actually the top of the soil. That is not soil irrigation. I wish it was. That's actually worm castings, but it still does look really pretty. Uh, so we were talking about my, I spread out my crop rotation earlier. And this is another reason why I did. This is a 10-year study done by Professor Joe Lauer. And this is just showing corn, wheat, and soybeans. Just by spreading out the rotation, you know, we can increase yields. You know, we're looking at, you know, 10 to 18 percent yield increase on some of this just by spreading out the rotation. If you look down wheat fallow wheat, you know, 30 bushel compared to, you know, uh, wheat after corn is 60 bushel. That's twice as much wheat just by rotation. Um, and, you know, that's how important rotation is. And, and rotation goes into understanding your carbon nitrogen ratios as well. I mean, if we want to better balance and have and have better and higher yielding uh, cash crops as well as more profitable cash crops, we need to diversify our rotation. Corn and soybeans is not good enough. And corn, wheat, soybeans is not good enough either. We really need to diversify. Also, if we want better prices for our corn and soybeans, if we quit raising corn and soybeans on more acres, our price will be better as well as every other crop. It's kind of supply and demand. So here's uh, just a little bit of diversity on my farm. Um, here's some of the cash crops I raise. I've got warm season, cool seasons. As you can tell, I have more warm season crops on my farm because I'm in a war warmer climate. If you're from up north, you'll probably have more cool season uh, uh, species in your, in your cash crops. Uh, there's a list of some of the cover crops I use on my farm. You know, I just want to show you guys of how important plant diversity is on our farm. You know, we need all of these different roots in the soil releasing different root exudates to feed different forms of biology. Uh, we need these, these different plants out there collecting sunlight from different angles, pumping that, you know, we're not going to try to let any sunshine spill off my farm. If we have different plants out there, short, tall, wide, skinny, we're collecting sunlight from all the different points. And so then we can photosynthesize more. And that's really, really important. So, you know, just diversity, diversify our cash crops. A typical three-year rotation of my farm would be uh, wheat, a double crop sunflower with a cover crop underneath them, corn, and then back to soybeans. And of course, I'd have a cover crop after the corn, uh, you know, probably a, a high carbon cover crop like, you know, cereal rye or something like that. It just depends on what I'm trying to accomplish on, on that particular farm. Um, and then, you know, my four-year rotations would be uh, Milo, a uh, cool season cover crop with some lagoon component to go to corn, then a cool season cover intended to go to beans, and then following that back to a cereal grain, such as wheat, barley, or oats. Um, understand your resource concern. You know, I was talking about that earlier. You know, I just listed a few here. This is so important and so overlooked. We have to be intentional, folks. If we want cover crops to work and we want cover crops to save us money, we have to understand what cover crops can bring to our system. You know, you can reach out to me or, you know, Colton or anybody else from these, these companies that understand resource goals and resource concerns, and we can help you with that. You know, if, if you're not as educated in that department, reach out to someone who is educated in that department to help you. I just listed, like I said, listed a few up here, you know, of what cover crops can do for your farm. And there's many others I didn't even list on here that they can do. So everyone asked me, okay, we know you can get nitrogen from the atmosphere via the rhizobia bacteria on legumes, but what about P and K? Well, I've reduced my P and K, my M, P and K by about 80% of my farm. Uh, this year, I only applied P and K on 50 acres of my 650 acre farm. So, you know, I listed off a few different ways of how we can acquire nutrients from cover crops, but the key is the living root. You know, we have to have that living root there. Sorry about that, guys. We have to have that living root there as long as possible, and we have to have plants growing. So, um, you know, the main takeaway too is we don't want to be planting too early. So if the cover crop is four inches tall, you know, we're not going to change our soil very quickly. We need to let these covers get a lot of biomass. And the more biomass you have out there, the more nutrients is in 
uh, you know, inside that biomass. So if we're really wanting to save on NP and K, we need to have that biomass. And once again, you know, what eats first? The biology eats first before the plant eats. So we have to have the biology out there as well uh, to be able to cycle these nutrients through. I'm not going to say you can cut out 80% of your P and K the first year. This is a building, you know, this is a building process. You know, we're building this up slowly. We're building, we're stacking this residue. You know, as Dale Strickler likes to say, we're building this lasagna, as you could say. But that's important. If you, we want to save on NP and K, we have to let the cover crops grow. We have to gain biomass and we have to have a lot of biomass. Plus, we have to have a, have a less intense cash crop rotation. We have to give time for those cover crops to do their job. And that's what this will look like. You know, that's my son, Jack, there in the picture on the right. That's what a typical corn or milo cover crop will look for me, look like for me. Um, you know, you can see some peas, some vetch. There's, there was crimson out there before. There's a little bit of rye out there, not too much, because once again, I need to balance that carbon nitrogen ratio. Right now, I like my carbon nitrogen ratios to be around a 40 to 1, because that's where I'm at, according to my soil test, for my Haney soil test. But, you know, early on, uh, you know, uh, a 20 to 1 was, was perfect. But as I'm cycling now, I, you know, I have more water tractable carbon out there and I need to increase my carbon in my cover crop to feed my biology. And this is a, this is a picture from my friend, Mike Imhoff. I love that picture, him lifting up the residue. His system's pretty similar to how I operate my corn system. And so I wanna show that. I just love that picture right there of him lifting up the residue. Think about what that thatch will do for suppressing weeds, retaining moisture, uh, you know, keeping the sunlight from hitting that bare soil. I mean, that's just huge. We got to think about this stuff, guys. We got to armor that soil. So uh, nature is powerful. And, you know, this is a hay field. This is a prairie hay field that has been hayed in my family since 1939. Now, this is not my farm. Uh, this is not a part of my operation at all. I don't do any hay on my operation, but it is a part of my grandfather's operation. So he's hayed this field. My family's hayed this field since 1939. And they've never applied any nitrogen, phosphorus, or potash on this farm. So I decided I would take a soil test, a Haney soil test on it. And so if you look at the Haney soil test, we're at 3.9% organic matter. You know, typically on our tests in our area, we're around 1.8 to 2.2% organic matter. So 3.9 is some of the highest that I've seen on a test coming from our area. Uh, you know, the soil health scores at 25. You know, most of our soils around our area are six to nine. So this is a this is what the, the soil test is showing that the soil is actually doing really well for having nutrients extracted off of it for so many years. I also took a tissue sample on the biomass of the hay itself. And look at that, isn't that funny? It, almost everything shows deficient except for the micronutrients shows sufficient. And, uh, and I believe uh, the calcium showed high, which is kind of funny because there's a bunch of limestone rocks out there that are actually sticking above the ground. So I believe that the, the prairie plants are actually uh, making making that mineral available, which is the calcium that they're getting from the limestone. Hmm. And, you know, like I said, the same tonnage since 1934 without anything applied on it, literally, no, nothing. And so, you know, that really got me thinking. And I asked my grandfather one time, I said, well, how come the prairies can do that? And my grandpa just said this, they're magic. I don't know how it works. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I want to dive into this a little bit deeper of, of you know, of why that is. And I got a hold of Dr. Buzz Clute. Uh, Dr. Buzz Clute's a friend of mine, and he did this uh, three-year study. And he applied no P and K for three years, and he added up the total bushels off the three crops and what you got off of them. So he actually had more yield by applying no P and K. But if you look, the, there was a cover crop between every one of the cash crops, and that was the key. He was maximizing biomass. He was not tilling. Um, he was following the principles. That's so important, guys. Follow the principles. Everything becomes so easy. You don't have to have, you don't have to have know all this different kind of knowledge that all these presenters know. If you just follow the principles and, and, and you know, and you have a little bit of help from some different mentors like I had when I was younger. Um, so, you know, looking at that, I decided to take that in full bore. You know, me, I just kind of jump into things. I go, I go all in. So in 2019, I've got the 63 acre field that has not ever had any P and, P and K applied on it since I've owned it. And this is what everyone calls the weedy beans. So the weedy bean field was not a prescription cover crop. It was a very wet year the year before. And so weeds took over. I mean, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even exaggerating. There was weeds everywhere out there. And I, I no-till planted soybeans in that field. 
Uh, so these are some of the, the weed species that were out there. I've got over 100 different weed uh, species uh, tissue samples. And this can teach you a lot. By tissue sampling these different kinds of weeds, we can see the different nutrients that are in these weeds. And the same, uh, the same thing applies to cover crops. You know, so we can start understanding why these said weeds are out there. So um, if you look at like pigweeds, pigweeds, 169 parts per million iron compared to, you know, uh, nut sedge, which is 155. Or even look at like uh, manganese, manganese 139 compared to 398. And then, but if you look at boron on pigweeds, pigweeds actually do a really good job of rendering boron available. I mean, what these, what these tissue samples of the, these weeds are showing me is that different plants are helping making these secondary micro and macronutrients available. And just by having the, I'm not saying, you know, you should let your farm go to weeds, but, you know, take this into context of cover crops as well. You know, all the different cover crops have, uh, have different, um, you know, have different uh, nutrients in them. But here's what we did with that weedy bean field. Uh, I had $140 land payment, $10 of property ta tax, $15 miscellaneous expense, $20 crop insurance, $0 cover crop, zero MP and K, $22 in soybean seed. I planted green, uh, $25 herbicide cost, and $35 for combining and hauling. So total soybean cost of production was $287. Now my land payment might be a little higher than your, some of your guys or a little bit less, but you know, Doing something like this, occasionally you can make money. I mean, I know the net income is $208 an acre. You're not going to get filthy rich with that, but I am making money. So that's important. This is where we're at right now with soybean. Uh, the year 2021 is the first year I do this. I use what I call the Aaron Silva method, which is, uh, and how I do it is a little bit different than how some other producers do it, such as Rick Clark and uh, Chad Christensen, some of them. What I'm using is I'm actually using Elbon rye mixed with my secretariat barley, both very, very early maturing uh, cereal grains. And so how I do this is I'll plant beans. So this year I planted soybeans on April 1st, and I did not roll this cover crop until May 20th. And I wanted the rye and the barley in full in pieces, which means they were fully flowered. Now I use my roller crimper and the beans at this stage were at B two and a half. So that's very important. Um, if they go past that, you will probably kill some of them. So it's very important that this is a timing factor. And this is this takes a little bit more management than I would say some of the standard things. But um, this is what we did with this field this year. So this is uh, my highest yielding beans that I've ever had. Uh, this is on my this is on my mom's place, as I call it, the farm I inherited from my dad. I have a zero dollar land payment because I don't owe anything on it. Ten dollar property tax, fifteen dollar miscellaneous expense. The reason I put that fifteen dollar miscellaneous expense on every one of my acres is because I just slap it on there for when I go and grab grease or or oil or whatever. It's just I just forget things, you know. So I just add that on there just be safe. Um, I twenty dollar crop insurance. My cover crop mix was uh, thirty two dollars an acre. Um, the broadcast I broadcasted that cover. That was eight dollars an acre. Zero N P and K, eighteen dollar an acre non GMO soybeans. Uh, planting cost was twenty dollars. Roller crimper cost eight dollars. The herbicide was eighteen dollars an acre with application. All I used was a half rate of Anthem Max. I did have weeds out there. I'm not going to tell you I did not. I did have weeds out there. They were not the cleanest field you know in the world. Uh, so total soybean cost of production was one hundred eighty four dollars an acre. And these soybeans yield 74.2. Now I did have some very timely rains this year, which helped. Um, but you know, this, this system here can be done in a lot of places across the United States. We can maximize, uh, you know, production of our cover crop as well as maximizing sunlight on our soybeans. So I plan a four nine early, which is kind of counterintuitive what other people do. A lot of people plant shorter maturity earlier so they can harvest quicker, but that's not really part of my rotation. I actually plant a four nine earlier and I was one day away from my soybeans when they first flowered at the longest day of the year. So that's so important. If we can, if we can capture as much sunlight as we possibly can when the, when the soybeans are blooming, that can be huge to set more pods. And I like this picture. I put this picture up uh, of that field. I want to show you the weed control I have out there. You know, with an eight dollar, with an eighteen dollar herbicide cost, you know that's pretty darn good. Um, you know, like I said, there were areas out there that were a lot weedier. I, I, I'm going to say that you know I had some smart weed issues for sure. And the yield monitor would go anywhere from forty five all the way up over ninety. But you know, average was seventy four point two. I sold those beans to a non GMO premium market uh, for fourteen sixty three. So my net income an acre was nine hundred one dollars and fifty five cents. That's pretty darn good, guys. We can make money with that.
I also raised Korean Lespedeza. Uh, Korean Lespedeza is a really good cash crop for me. It's one of my better cash crops, and it it's a underutilized cover crop. It has a lot of potential. Um, it's a non-bloating lagoon, so you can graze it when it's fully bloomed. Um, it, it has a very good shade tolerance. It is, it's very, uh, seems to be very drought tolerant as well as heat tolerant. Um, and, you know, it kind of, it starts hitting peak production about that late August period. So in like, let's say if you're in a Kentucky 31 area where you have Kentucky 31 fescue, um, interseeding lespedes in your pasture, we just broadcast, we frost seed, it's how we seed it. Um, you know, can actually really help, you know, extend, maybe extend your grazing season out. Uh, you know, Green Cover Seed supports me on my Korean Lespedeza. They, they purchased Korean Lespedeza. So if you're buying Korean Lespedeza from them, it was probably produced from my farm. Um, so I'm very thankful to have that market with them. And I also, I also uh, sell it to some different companies for uh, bird seed. So it's kind of, uh, kind of neat, but uh, what the University of Missouri tells me is that Korean Lespedee is actually a really good food source, winter food source for quail and other uh, wildlife. And, you know, speaking of wildlife, uh, you know, we're essentially raising giant uh, food plots with our cover crops. Uh, that big buck there was shot on my property. Um, you know, that there, also that picture was there, was taken on one of my farms. You know, we are bringing in the deer. When all these other, when all this other ground around me is fallow, you know, we're bringing them in. We're bringing the deer in in a lot. You know, so we're getting the animal integration from the wildlife as well. And, you know, uh, I'm going to just touch a little bit on my chickens here. You know, my chickens, everything likes to eat chickens. I go through so many chickens every single year. I hate to say it. I also sell eggs. Uh, you know, we, we, we flow through chickens, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into them a lot, but we do sell eggs. There's my little punchline. If you're swinging by my farm, come buy some eggs. Uh, and you know, the main, the main livestock on my farm are cattle, you know, and I utilize amp grazing on my farm, you know, that's adaptive multi-paddock grazing. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, I would, I would watch any kind of video from Dr. Alan Williams. Uh, Alan Williams, you know, really goes into that about, you know, compounding cascading effects, plan disturbances you know, fluctuating stock density, that's, that's a, essentially what the system means. You know, don't get in any kind of rotation. Take yourself out of a rotation. Um, don't think you're going to go around clockwise every year on your farm. Don't think you're going to graze the same stocking rate every single year. That's, that will fail. We need, we need to diversify our grazing as well, at, you know, as our, as our system. So uh, do we really need to feed hay for six months? Here's my cows out there grazing through some snow. Yes, we do get a little bit of snow in South Missouri. So I want to take a picture of the one day we get, did get snow to prove it. <laughs> uh, the cows are grazing just fine under the Kentucky 31s underneath that snow canopy. Um, you know, this is uh, the typical thing you see in Southwest Missouri. This is how most farmers feed their animals in a confined area. Doesn't that just look yummy? Doesn't that make you want to go eat a bunch of beef? Um, you know, that's just nasty. It's inefficient. It's not profitable. And why would you want to go and get your pickup stuck every single day in that mud hole? You know, that makes no sense to me. So if you're going to feed hay, let's do it like this. Let's think smarter, not harder. Let's bale grade. Let's start the tracker up one time a year. And let's say November, let's set the bales up to be grazed. And then let's just move a poly wire to however many bales you need to supply for your herd. You don't have to go and fire up a, a tractor every day or a pickup every day and take the cows out there and fight mud because typically, you know, winters are wet. Why would you want to do that? Why don't we just bale graze? It just makes so much more sense to me. Or better yet, instead of bale grazing, you know, I believe God gave cows four legs to go out and graze, not to stand in a hay bunk. <laughs> so winter 2020, uh, I only fed nine bales of hay to my 80 cow-calf pairs. And, you know, how I did that was I utilized different forages. You know, I graze, I graze uh, my perennial pastures. I graze cover crops throughout the growing season. I, I'll graze milo stalks. You know, just anything that you can graze, if you can put cows out there, graze them. And, you know, I drive by the Midwest, you know, whenever I go and speak at different places, and I see a fallow farm next to a farm, that, a pasture that's grazed down like my front yard. Why are we not helping each other? Why, why is that farmer, instead of leaving his farm fallow all winter, not putting a cover crop out there, making some money off the guy that's right next to him with cattle, and just by building a little bit of fence, we can help our neighbors. We can not, you know, not, we don't have to put up all this hay that we put out, guys. I mean, you know, let's just try to help each other out. You know, I, I you know, a third of my income a year is custom grazing. I custom graze other people's animals on my, my row crop land. That's a third of my income. That's huge. And then high stock density grazing. Uh-oh, internet is unstable. I hope, hope, we, hope we hold out. 
Um, high stock density grazing, uh, you know, when you run higher stock density grazings, your cows will start consuming more weeds. Um, I've noticed my weed species intake has gone way up uh, just by running my cows at a million pound stock density in those problem areas occasionally. You know, they don't run at that million pound stock density all day long. You know, typically my, typically my stock density is around 160,000. That's what I'm typically running every single day. But, you know, if we push up over a million, those cows become more aggressive. You know, nature is competitive. I mean, whenever you put a cover crop out there, plants stretch out for light, right? Well, same way with cows. If you put cows tight, they're like, hey, this is competition. Let's eat what we can eat because there's only so much forage available. Uh, you know, my cows, uh, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty strong, hard system on them. No mineral, no feed, no pesticides. Now, I will say if I'm grazing milo stalks, I will, or corn stalks, I will supplement mineral just because the plant diversity is not high enough to supply for their diet. And what I've seen with that is when I took out mineral, I mean, my cows, I've got multiple pictures of my cows eating thistles, blackberries in the dead of winter, uh, smart weeds. I've not found a plant on my farm that my cows will not voluntarily eat. I'm not forcing my cows to eat them. They just eat them. You know, uh, people are like, man, your cows must have tough mouths for eating thistles. M you know, that must mean that they need iodine. Thistles are very high in iodine. So I think that when the cows go and select for a thistle, they need the iodine. Um, if they go and they grab a little bit of hairy vetch out of my pasture, they need some cobalt. So, you know, if we have enough different plant species out there to supply for their diet, they'll go and select for that. You know, it's just like choice mineral. If you think about choice mineral, you know, I kind of like that idea of choice mineral where the cows will go and select what kind of mineral they need, you know, they'll lick out of the block what they need. It's the same way with plants. If you have enough diversity in your pasture, like this picture here, this is my, this is my pasture. If you have enough diversity, those cows will go and select for the plants they need to supply for their mineral. D do any of my animals look like they are hurting um, in body condition or, or do any of them have bad eyes? If I have an animal that has a bad eye, I cull them off. Now people ask me, well, what do you do when your cows don't breed back? Well, they get cold off. You know, I'm the predator in my herd. If they don't get bred, they get cold. It's that simple. There's no second chances on my farm. You know, we have to be the predator of our herd. So uh, 2019, uh, cows finally met row crop land. <laughs> that was a big step for me. And that was that was the biggest leap for a lot of farmers in this movement. Um, you know, if we want to change and we, if we want to advance our soil health, we have to have animals on the land. Uh, you know, essentially think about a cow pat as essentially the perfect soil. <laughs> you know, when that cow pat breaks down, it turns to soil. So, you know, the cows can select high lignified sedan grass with higher protein, you know, cow peas and turn that into this perfect, uh, you know, this perfect cow pad that will eventually turn into soil. Um, you know, also cows grazing sedan, it, when they take off a bite of the leaf, that plant then sends signals to the soil to attract in biology to try to regrow back. Same way with perennial pastures. You know, so if we, um, if we just, if, you know, if, if we're going to plant a cover crop, the easiest way to turn covers into cash is with cattle. That's the simplest way. If you're going to plant a cover crop and you have the fence, put cattle on there. I don't care if you're custom grazing or if it's your own cattle, you're making money. You can actually physically see that money, especially if you're custom grazing. First time I put cattle on row crop land, I started seeing this. I started seeing mushrooms growing on my, pa on my farm ground. And I'd never seen that before. And I'd been using cover crops for, you know, a couple of years before this. And there was something about it. it you know, the cow's rumen is essentially like this inoculation bank and, and the cows are going around inoculating your whole, whole farm with bacteria and fungi. It, it's, it's fantastic. And so, you know, healthy soils are near one-to-one. -one. I'm nowhere near that. I'm getting, I'm getting better though. I really am. I still, my PLFAs are starting to show that I'm getting better. Um, but, you know, like I said, I mean, look at the mushrooms there and I am in a warmer, wetter environment. So I think that might help speed up. I can, I can increase biology faster here in the South than you folks up North can. But you folks up north can uh, build organic matter faster than I can down here in the south because I'm cycling so much longer. So we have advantages in both. Uh, so this is how I custom graze. Um, I'm not going to go deep into this. I'm not going to dive deep into that. But always have a contract. That's the most important. And you can put, you can add about another $100 an acre to your profit. That's profit. A uh, gross is around normally about you know, 120 for me is about average gross, but when I figure in my time, wear and tear on my poly reels and things like that, you know, that takes about $20 an acre away, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in profits. So, so about $100 an acre. So even you guys that are corn soybean farmers, if you've got fences on your farm, think about how much another $100 an acre 
can can bring to your operation. You know, maybe that can help pay off some more land debt, or maybe that can help you know uh, send your kids to college or something like that. Whatever you want to do with it. Uh, so Austin Campbell, he's a friend of mine from Missouri. He did a study with the University of Missouri about uh, water holding percentage in the soil with cover crops and no-till. And what I want to show on this slide is how no-till alone is not good enough. We have to have the cover crops in there, guys. Look at this, 41% increase in the water percentage underneath the corn canopy, 44% underneath the soybeans. So think about how huge that would be. You guys in Western Kansas and up North where you're, you're dry or, 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 or California, just by adding these cover crops to your system, you know, you can increase your, your water holding percentage by 44%. That's huge. And this is just a one year study. This isn't like a 10 year study of increasing your infiltration rates for 10 years of cover ups. This is a one year study. So we can make a difference in one year, especially with water holding capacity. So, you know, at the very beginning, I talked about how, um, you know, my first corn, no till corn uh, trial was a failure. This is 2020. So this is last year. You know, last summer we were fairly dry. I don't want to say the word drought because <laughs> the guys in Western Kansas would kill me if I said the word drought, but we went about three months without much rainfall at all. Uh, these pictures here were taken, uh, this is the same field, this, these are right, or not the same field, I'm sorry, the, these two pictures are from farms that are right across the road from each other. Now the picture of the corn on the left was planted a little bit sooner, but look how drought stricken is, look at those leaves and look at the soil underneath it. Um, you know, that, that soil right there, if you mowed off that corn field, you put up a couple basketball hoops, you could have a court right there of how hard that field is. And over in my field, over in my field, um, you can see the residue. The, the plants, the corn plants, are not hurting for moisture at all. And this was the dead heat of summer. I think when I took this picture, it was almost 100 degrees that day, and, and the corn's looking just fine. And this is what we did: uh, the corn yielded 160 bushel. Um, I will say there is a difference in hybrids. I had a, I had another hybrid on this farm. It was 50 bushel less, guys, on the same farm with the same management. So hybrids do matter. One thing I will say about picking a corn hybrid for a cover crop system, make sure it's a workhorse, make sure it has good standability, and it has a very good emergence. Those are the three main things. Also, I like longer maturities. I've gone longer maturities on my corn. It seems like they can take the heat better. And even though I'm planting later, I'm trying to, like I said earlier, I was trying to maximize nitrogen production. I'm still planting longer maturing corn plants. But yeah, that's my economics. I only applied 80 units of nitrogen. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a half a unit of nitrogen applied, or, or that's a bushel of that's a that's a bushel of corn per half unit of nitrogen applied. That's a really good return, and I I atone that to my cover crop. My cover crop seed in ratio last year was a 32 to one according to my uh, biomass sample, and it was Facilia annual ryegrass, a little bit of sugar rye, a little bit of barley, Balanza crimson vetch, peas, and rape seed, um, and that was sown on October 4th, and uh, I planted June 5th. I don't think I put my planting. I planted June 5th of last year. So, so that's that's pretty good net income, $401 an acre. We can make money with that, guys. It's, you know, I like to put up the slides with corn and beans because it's relatable. I have other cash crops that I can make a lot more money on, but um, corn and soybeans is a good stepping stone. And if I show you guys how I make my system work, you know, that might set the seed so you guys can try to, you know, uh, you know, change your system a little bit with, you know, soil health in mind. So what's new for 2021? I went out and took uh, the picture on the left today. I wanted to showcase uh, what I was doing um, today. What we're working on is companion cropping, raising a cash crop with a cover crop growing underneath it. Uh, I stole this idea from your your dad, <laughs> Keith. Uh, Keith, you know, Keith was the first one I knew about, and then I think Gabe may have been one of the first. I'm not sure to raise sunflowers with cover crops underneath them, with the intent to harvest sunflowers over the top, and then have a cover crop underneath. Uh, the picture on the left is black oats. Uh, this, like I said, this picture was taken today on the left. That is black oats with fava beans, peas, and turnips. So I will harvest the black oats and I'm trying to bring diversity to my system, guys. You know, corn and soybean monocultures are not good enough. They are not good enough for our farm. Um, we have to diversify our systems and this is what I'm really trying to do. I wanna get away from monocultures. My goal in the next four or five years is to no longer being to raise monocultures. And that means I'm probably gonna give up soybeans. Soybeans are hard on my soil anyways, but I can make money with soybeans. They're pretty consistent, but I think in about five years, most of my farmland will be paid for. Uh, yeah, I better get this rolling. Um, so I've only got a couple of slides here left. You know, I just asked the question, which of these systems is better for the environment, guys? You know, is this tillage-based system with the soil eroding off in the rivers um, and the phosphorus and nitrogen getting in the river, uh, the lack of habitat for wildlife, the lack of habitat for insects, is that system really better than, than the system? 
and that I'm talking about with cover crops, you know, cover crops and no-till provide not only more food for us, because uh, I have seen higher yields. Since I started using cover crops, my yields have increased. But it also, you know, provides so much food and habitat for so much wildlife. And I just wish that more farmers would start turning to this. It's really important to me that, you know, we start, we start changing, you know, things on our farms. Um, you know, this is probably a picture that's made me, I don't know, I guess kind of famous. I don't know. Uh, this is a field that are literally border each other. This is my longest running no-till cover crop field compared to my neighbor's field. The reason why the soil in my right hand there is darker is because of the carbon, guys. I talked about carbon earlier. The mm -hmm. plants exude carbon, okay? If you look at the tissue samples of the plants or the worm casting, it's all carbon. Carbon's the highest percentage. So the more carbon we add to our system, the more organic matter we'll have. Organic matter is approximately <laughs> 58, 50 to 58% uh, carbon. Organic matter is approximately 50 to 58% carbon. So the more carbon we add to our system, uh, the more organic matter we'll have. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Green Cover Seed. Once again, I went over about a minute. Um, this is my phone number. You guys can add me on Facebook. If you have any more questions, you can call me. I have my phone on me seven days a week. I answer text phone calls throughout the day, all the way up throughout the night till I go to bed. So just try not to reach me on Sunday if you could. I'd like to have just that one day if I could. Thank you. For sure. Well, thanks so much, Mac. I think that was, that was a really good presentation. Um, yeah, really good stuff there. I am monitoring the questions. Um, so if on Facebook or on the, on the Zoom, um, please get those to us and we can kind of do a few minutes of questions. Um, Mac, I kind of had one written down before we even started and I think you kind of answered it. I was going to ask something about, do you think regenerative farming is, is profitable or more profitable? Um, but kind of what you displayed shows sure. pretty, pretty well that that <laughs> is. Um, I kind of follow that up by maybe, what do you think is the biggest obstacle that prevents, um, you know, producers from going down that regenerative path? Uh, mindset. You know, you have to change your mindset. The very first step in going to a system like this is changing your mind, uh, you know, and, and this has been a complete change in my life. You know, uh, I was going through a pretty rough patch there when my dad passed away and, you know, regenerative regenerative ag has brought life to my farm every day i'm dealing with life i love you know when gabe talks about just the only thing he does different than other any other farmer is he brings life to his farm and i love that you know i i, I love bringing animals on my farm that's why we have chickens yeah the chickens don't make us much money but you know life's so enjoyable yesterday my wife and i our incubator hatched a couple baby chicks um you know just just i think working with life is so much more enjoyable than working with you know, or killing something every day. And so the first step in into going this system is changing your mind. That's the very first step. Yeah. We have one question here from Nicholas. He says, any tips for cover crop mix ahead of wheat? Okay, so one thing I will say on that uh, I'm not, no, I'm not going to answer that question for you because I need to, I need to understand your resource goals, um, uh, what you're trying to do with the cover crop. Um, also, whether we're talking spring wheat or if we're talking winter wheat, um, if we're talking winter wheat, you're not going to be able to get much nitrogen from a cover crop going to wheat. And the reason for that is because biology is slowed down in the winter. You're not cycling as fast. So you're not cycling as many nutrients. So you might have a straight lagoon crop a cover crop in the summer and then plant, you know, no-till plant wheat in it, but you're not going to get very much nitrogen from that just because your biology is not cycling that, that much in the winter. Yeah, a lot of that would depend on on context and your goals. Also, I also would ask where they're from, you know. Right. Yeah. Yep. Where they're from is very important too, to know where they're from. Yeah. And yeah, with your goals as well, I think you made a good point um, just popped to my head about compaction and things like that. You were talking about the radishes and brassicas. I think, um, you know, kind of starting with compaction, you know, the radishes are kind of a cool one you would think would, would kind of do a good job of that. And it, it's a good, it's a good aspect of that, but yeah, the grasses, um, especially warm season grasses like sorghums. Um, and if you get a good graze off of them and that stimulates the root growth, um, yeah, grasses are really underrated for compaction. So. Yes. I thought that was a great point. Um, let's see. One plan I will one plan I will say is is really good at breaking out. Yeah, uh, 
one, one plant I will say that's very good about breaking up compaction is annual ryegrass. You know, uh, annual ryegrass is very yeah. good about breaking compaction layers. Also, annual ryegrass is really good at rendering P and K available. Uh, annual ryegrass is one of the few plants that releases potassium sulfate, potassium chloride, sodium nitrate, and sodium fluoride from, from the roots. So it does a very good job of, of breaking apart rock material and, and decayed organic matter and turning that into available P and K. Hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure where Dan is from, but he asked how the fishing is around there. <laughs> the fishing? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's pretty good around here. Yeah, the fishing's pretty good. You got a lot of night crawlers for it, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. I got plenty of worms. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to see if there's any other questions here. Um, another one I kind of have that I like um, to hear the answer is just, uh, and maybe you kind of already included it in your talk, but uh, what's one thing that you would tell a, a producer to um, kind of change on their operation a little bit different than the mindset, but maybe just kind of a, a practical step or um, just kind of a, a piece of advice you'd give to a producer trying to get started in this? Sell all your tillage equipment, take that equity and buy cover crops. I like it. <laughs> Is that good enough for you? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's great. Um, yeah, I think that that's really good. So um, let's see. Dan, the, the fishing guy says he's in Illinois. So that's where he's at. Um, but any, uh, any yeah. other things? See if we get another question here and or not. Like but... said, you know, if you guys have any questions, yeah, you guys can feel free to reach out to me. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, any, anything else at the end you want to plug or kind of give an update about, you know, any other speaking engagements or anything else exciting you have going on here soon? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll give a plug for uh, the no -till, National No-Till Convention. I'll be hosting uh, a classroom during that. Um, I've also got some other things throughout the winter. I got another conference. I got a couple conferences in Kansas I'm speaking at. Um, I don't I don't have the dates off the top of my head for them. Um, and then I've got a couple other webinars to do as well. But uh, you know, the University of Missouri, you know, they have seemed to really reach out to me. And uh, guys like Rob Myers, you know, uh, Rob is just so uh, influential, you know, about me. He just is so helpful. And I actually have taught him a few things. You know, he asked me, well, what cover crops or winter annual cover crops? Do you feel do best in what soils? And my number one and number two is number one is annual ryegrass and number two is balanza. I don't know why, but it seems like balanza can tolerate wet soils very, very well. Um, so, you know, where we're at, you know, we have waterlogged soils a lot. I know that's kind of weird to think that we have too much water, but sometimes we really do have too much water. I feel like that actually hurts my uh, soil health. Uh, you know, it, it, whenever your soil is just ponded, you know, it's I'm always just trying to keep as many roots as I can in the ground, but there's only so much you can do. And these, my, these systems, I'm not working very much soil, Jake. And I mean, a lot of my farms have maybe a half inch of soil. I mean, it's hard for me to get a, it's hard for me to pull a soil test on some of my farm because I just hit solid rock, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I, I totally understand that. Uh, Mac, are you able to see the chat, see this question here from Madison? Or I can read it to you if okay, you need. Let me go up here. Yeah, just read it to me. Okay. Uh, what resource has been most invaluable for understanding different plant species and how they interact with each other and the soil in regards to designing a cover crop? Uh, probably the SARE book. Um, there's a, it you can download that for free that was when i was early on that was a book i read early on um that talks about the different cover cross species um you know I, really one thing that i've done a lot of is uh, i've just researched the individual species themselves and mm -hmm. really just memorized that stuff 
um, you know, uh, you, uh, you just, you just, the more research you do and the more you're familiar with them. Uh, another resource is actually Green Cover Seed's website. Uh, I, I use that, I've used that for years. Green Cover Seed, they have a really good resource on, you know, basic carbon nitrogen ratios of fully, you know, reproductive, um, uh, you know, plants, uh, species. They also just, you know, tell a little bit about what the different cover crops do. It's not really super in detail, but, you know, that's a good resource too if you're just starting out, you know, to learn more about cover crops. Yep, absolutely. Um, kind of a follow up that same person asked, uh, what animals do you plan to integrate next besides ducks? Besides ducks, okay. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I, uh, I, I've, I had ewes in the past, you know, I've had four or five ewes. Um, yeah, that was a disaster. <laughs> They're tough to keep in. I need, I need better genetics. I need Colton to sell me some good news. I was actually talking to Colton Catterton today and, uh, you know, I, I do need some, I need some, I need some good genetics. I need some, I need these ewes that are really fat and tall that'll stay into one polywire. That's what I need. Yeah. So I'd say probably <laughs> sheep will be the next thing I, I integrate on my farm if I had to guess. Gotcha. Okay. Another one here. Um, do you plant your rye grass with a drill or do you broadcast? I know we've done it several different ways. Uh, I don't ever plant ryegrass by itself. I never have individually. Uh, I always, if you can drill a cover crop, drill it. If, mm -hmm. if you know, if conditions are good or good enough, I, it's worth the, it's worth the drill pass because you're going to get a more even stand and that's going to help everything. I mean, that's even going to help you the following year because, you know, if you have a, a good stand, that's going to help with weed suppression. If you're trying to maybe, a, you know, pull some nitrogen from the atmosphere, give, uh, you know, or, or make a home for some nitrogen fixing bacteria. You know, it's just important to have a really good stand. I feel like drilling is the is your best chance of having a good stand. But I have broadcasted on wet years. Uh, this this winter, uh, or I'm sorry, this fall, I've put in 160 acres of my covers were broadcasted with an Amazon spreader. Um, it's not mine. It's a co-op spreader. But uh, you know, on wet years, you just got to do what you can do. I mean, it doesn't matter. If it's wet, get the get a way to get the cover crop out there because every 27 days your aggregates are breaking down. If you don't have a living root, um, you have to have a living root there as long as possible. So you know, get the cover crop out there. I don't care how you do it. Like I said earlier, I don't care. It's my cutoff date on my cover crops for me personally is Christmas. Um, that's my cutoff date. Um, I will I will frost seed something, and I promise you, I'll still put in something in the spring. So just, just get a cover crop in there as much as you can. Yep. Yep. I would agree with that. Um, if you are going to broadcast, you know, it's just helpful to, to get that incorporated somehow or another, get a good seed to soil contact. Um, really, it just brings in more variables with, you know, timely rainfall. But yeah, if you have good moisture, it can, it can get established just fine. Um, let's see. We'll just do this last question and then probably wrap up. Do you measure bri bricks? Yeah, I will all? say on that, Jakin. Uh, one thing that yes, yes, I do. That's the reason why I move my cows around two and three p.m. in the evenings. Yep, yep. And also, I've measured bricks and soybeans and corn plants. I've also tried applying some uh, some different forms of sugar to increase bricks. That has helped, um, you know, but. Uh, don't get too caught up in bricks levels. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, you know, yeah, there is something to say with insect, you know, pressure and stuff. But, you know, like, like I said earlier, if you focus on the principles and you have someone help you get your cover crop blends, um, and if you have, you know, a, a consultant or something, somebody come to your farm and help you, you know, just understand the principles. That's step number one. You know, you don't have to get caught up in all this extra stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What were you going to say? Sorry, I cut you off on the broadcasting. Oh, I was going to say, uh, yeah, my internet's a little lag. What I was going to say was, uh, if I'm going to broadcast cover crops, like what I do, what I did this fall was I'll wait for the best chance of rain and then I'll, broad, I'll have the co-op broadcast the day before. Um, and I don't incorporate the seeds in the soil. I'll use smaller seeded cover crop species. 
Um, you know, so if I'm going to Milo, like I have done on some of my uh, fields I had to broadcast, I used a higher rate of balance clear than I normally would just because that stuff's like sand. It's going to, you know, when you get those hard rains, it's going to find soil. And, um, you know, also, you know, I, I'll look for, I specifically look for cover crop varieties like rye and triticale that have a higher seeds per pound. And mm -hmm. that's the reason why I also increase my seeding rate by 30%. So those are just a few things that I do if I'm broadcast. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, thanks again for sharing. Um, I look forward to working with you and speaking with you in the future um, and appreciate you coming on. I forgot to mention in the beginning, uh, I'm not Noah. Noah is out. Um, and he just had a baby, so we wish him and his family the best. He's still doing a lot of leg work behind these webinars, so we appreciate his work. Uh, <laughs> next week is uh, an also a webinar at 5.30 to 6.30 Central Time. I think that's with David Johnson and the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor. Uh, so I hope I'm right on that information, but be sure to join us. I believe uh, Keith, dad, is going to be hosting that one. So um, we're excited for that as well. Any closing thoughts, Mac? Hopefully we didn't lose him, but um, I guess we're about to close up anyways. Oh, are you with us here? Uh, biggest takeaway, once again, I, I keep, beating the dead horse you know just follow the principles try to implement the principles on your farm everything else just comes into play if you just follow the principles amen to that appreciate it so all right thanks for joining and we'll um talk to you later hope you all have a good night yep yeah i was are you there yep